turn to the book of Galatians chapter 5 and then also to the book of Romans chapter number 7. We'll be mostly in Romans chapter number 7 tonight and so but we'll look at Galatians chapter 5 as our kickoff verse and I think probably all of you remember that uh, last Wednesday night we a message on the battle with temptation and sin and I promised that I would uh, finish up on that tonight. I don't know if we'll get finished tonight. If we don't, we'll get finished the next Wednesday night. Uh, and I want to spend enough time with this that, with this that we can get it, okay? Because um, I really think, uh, in my own personal experience as a Christian, uh, this was my greatest need was to, to understand this conflict and to learn how to get victory. Um, most of our frustration as Christians when, when we're trying to live the Christian life is the fact that we have this sin nature. Amen? Um, you know, we have frustration about finances, and we have frustration about sickness, and we have frustration about circumstances. But, uh, but, but if you're really trying to live for God, if you're really trying to do something, if you're really trying to live a righteous and holy life, and you're really trying to be a good Christian, you're going to be frustrated a lot. You just are. And I said it all the time, if living Christian was easy, everybody do it. And, uh, you know, so it, it is a frustrating thing. And uh, so um, it, it, it's, it, it's imperative for us that we understand this and we get biblical, biblical teaching on it. As I mentioned, I got saved at the age of five, introduced shortly thereafter to a sin that was a wicked sin that took control of my life. When I was six years old, my grandmother said I'd be in prison someday because of the wickedness that was in my heart. And I was already saved. But the sin nature, it, we're born with. We were born with a sin nature, okay? Sinning is natural. It comes from the natural man. That's why the Bible says the natural man, that's the unsaved man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Well, my natural man doesn't either. The Bible also calls it the old man. The Bible calls it the flesh, Okay, and so we all have it. We were born with that. Okay, and so it's not natural. And when you get saved, you don't lose the flesh. It'd be great when I got saved if the flesh died. Okay, but it doesn't die. That's why the Bible teaches us that we have to crucify the flesh. That's why the Bible teaches that we have to put off the old man and put on the new man. That's why the Bible says that, that we have to uh, we have to die daily and we have to understand this battle. And so. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, we'll just look there again tonight as our kickoff verse we looked here last week. Here the Bible, written to the Galatian Christians, written to save people. Okay, that's the key. When you study your Bible, understand who the book is written to. There are only three books written to the preacher. First and Second Timothy and Titus. All the rest of those books, the Gospels are written about Jesus. The book of Acts is the history of the, of the apostles. But the rest of the books in the Bible are written to the church, and that's you and I. Okay, If you're saved, Galatians is written to you as a, as a, as a Christian, not as a Sunday school teacher or as a bus worker, as a preacher or a missionary or an evangelist, but to the, but to the Christian. If you're saved, we're all God's children, amen? And, and God wants his children to obey him, and he wants his children to do right, and he wants his children to be blessed. And, and so he teaches us in the word of God what he expects of us and how to do right and how to obey and then how to have his blessing. And the greatest reason for living righteously is so you can have God's blessing, amen? I mean, because uh, the Bible teaches us if you live according to his word, he blesses you. If you don't live according to his word, he blisters you. Amen? So I used to say, folks, when I lead them to the Lord, you know, I don't, I don't try to live for the Lord and do right uh, to get to heaven. I live to the Lord because I want to be blessed instead of blistered. Amen? I want God to smile down upon me and say, well done, instead of you, you naughty boy. Amen? And I want that. And so, but here's the battle. So Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 we read last week says, This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, capital S, that's talking about the Holy Spirit, which you have if you're saved, amen? They saved tonight, if you're saved tonight, you have the Holy Spirit. If you're not saved tonight, you don't have the Holy Spirit. It'd be impossible for you to walk in the Spirit, okay? A lost person will never walk in the Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean they might not know right from wrong. The Bible says that the, that the law of God is written on our hearts, 
So mankind, though he is depraved and has a sin nature, he has also been given a moral sense. We know there is right and wrong. And we know certain things are right and wrong. And we need to be educated more and more about that so we understand the whole gamut. But we understand there's something inside us that understands there's some right and wrong. But to have the Spirit of God in you, you have to be saved. When you get saved, the Spirit of God comes in. He dwells in your body. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought, you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. He's the earnest of the inheritance. What is earnest money? Money. It's money placed down saying that I'm not going to take this right now, but I'll come back and get you. And so when Jesus came and when we got saved, he said, I'm not ready to rapture you or take you home. So I give you the spirit as a promise that, so that you know I'm coming and you belong to me. He's the seal. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. That means an official stamp. So if you have the spirit, that means I'm, you know, if I, for instance, if I have a birth certificate, that doesn't have a seal on it. They don't believe I'm born. Well, I'm standing right here, but you're official. You don't have an official birth certificate, so you have no proof that you're the you're the real deal. When you get the Holy Spirit, that's the proof that you're the real deal as far as being saved is. Amen. So it says here, walk in the Spirit. So walk in Him. Well, how do we walk in the Spirit? The Spirit dwells in us. How do we walk in the Spirit? We walk in the Spirit by letting the Holy Spirit be the director of our steps. We walk in the Spirit by walking with the Spirit as he leads us through the day, amen? And he wants you, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, it says. The steps, not a course, but the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So God says, I'll be with you every step. I'll tell you where to go. I will guide you. That's what the Spirit does. He guides us into all truth. He's our guide. He's our compass. He's our director, and he's in our life. And he's trying to get us to do the right thing. He's trying to show us what's wrong and what's right. He talks to us, not in an audible voice, amen, but in our mind, our, our, our reasoning that makes us different than the animals, the Holy Spirit can speak to us, amen. We, we talk about the heart and the mind, and I personally believe that the heart and the mind are, uh, are, are two separate entities, but really the same thing, amen. I don't, I don't think this is the heart here. That's a pump that pumps the organs, but I think the heart and mind, that part that God deals with is right up here. In our intellect, that's how where our emotions are, where we think and cause us to get angry and think and cause us to get teary-eyed and, and where we have our feelings. And, but I think it's up here, but the Bible talks about it. So the Spirit is in our heart. It says, now walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, it says, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of flesh. Now there's a promise. If you and I will walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So every time you and I feel, fulfill the lust of flesh, it's an indication we're not walking in the Spirit. Amen? And that's often, okay? I'm not condemning, but here's a, t a, a truth. Verse 17, for the flesh, and here's the reason, for the flesh, that's the sin nature, the old man, what we were born with, the natural man, which you don't have to teach to do right or wrong. Amen? Like I said last week, you don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't have to teach them to hit. You don't have to teach them pe people to steal. It just comes naturally. Amen? You don't have to teach people to obey. You're all the time spending time teaching your children. Stop lying. Stop me. Stop doing that. Quit hitting your brother. Hey, that isn't yours. Put it back. Don't treat that person that way. Because that's the natural man. If you walk in the, for the flesh, this natural man lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And so if you're saved, you're, I said to somebody one time, we're, we're all schizophrenic. If you're saved, you have a dual personality. You have the old man that's wanting to do wrong and has all these crazy thoughts. I don't know about you, but I have some crazy thoughts sometimes. And I ask myself, where in the world did those come from? I said, God, sometimes I have some thoughts that are just absolutely, uh, 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 just absolutely awful. I mean, nasty. And I think, God, where do those things come from? You know, well, I'll tell you where they come from. They come from my sin nature and from the devil. That's where they come from, okay? And they may come from something I've watched or something I heard or something I read. And so I have it in my head. I have it in my mind. And it's a possibility that the flesh can use that to cause me to think things and to desire things that I shouldn't desire. So the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And so I tell you that the flesh here, lusteth, is an action verb. The flesh is not sitting there passive. It's pulling, pulling, pulling. 
And the Spirit's not sitting in our life passive. He's pulling, pulling, pulling. And so a Christian is a spiritual tug of war. You, constantly, you know, when I was a kid, I used to watch Tom and Jerry. You know, Tom and Jerry. And, the, and, and, then, and then Tom would get there and look at Jerry, you know. And then there would be an angel sitting on this shoulder, and there'd be a devil sitting on this shoulder, and the devil would say to him, yeah, and the angel would say, uh-uh. And you know, that's not the way it is, but that's kind of a, 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 a simple illustration of what really goes on in the life of a Christian. You got the devil, the world, and the flesh sitting on this shoulder saying, let's go over here and do this. And you have the Spirit saying, no, let's don't do that. Let's go over here and do this. Amen. That's the battle. And so it says there, and these are contrary the one to the other. They're never, they're never in sync. You can never say the flesh made me do right. And you can never say that the, that the, that the Spirit made you do wrong. Amen. These are contrary the one to the other. Now look at the next statement. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Now, is God here condoning sin? Nobody's trying to teach you why you and I can't do what we want to do right. How can we can't do right? Because we got this battle going on. I wish I could do right every time. I wish I could do right 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I wish I didn't have all these failures and all these sins. I wish I didn't lose my temper so much. I wish I didn't get so short with my, with, with my patience. I wish I, you know, hey man, I, you say, well, I don't smoke and I don't drink and I don't cuss and I don't chew and I go with girls to do. I know, but there's a whole lot more sins than that, Amen. Amen. There are, there are probably worse sins than that. The Bible says the tongue is an unruly evil set on fire of hell. The tongue is probably worse than those things. I'm not condoning those things. But we got this idea in some people, a Christian, well, I don't, I don't do this, I don't do that, and I don't do that, so I'm a pretty good person. Well, you know, when I found out God dealt with my, my external sins first, God dealt with my, uh, my, my, my language and some other stuff that I was involved in, and then when we got done with that, I thought I'd arrived. He said, now we're going to start dealing on the real important stuff. We're going to start dealing on your heart. Are dealing on those attitudes and, 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 that, and that nastiness that's inside of you. And I thought I was done. I had a lot to do. And I still got a lot to do. Amen? And I can't do the things that I would. How many times my heart is broken because I know I did, I did something I shouldn't have. And I know that I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And my heart's probably more broken over the things I don't do that I know I should do. Because the truth of the matter is I've got a pretty good handle over not doing the things I shouldn't. And I really think most Christians get a pretty good handle on the don'ts. But we have a real hard struggle with the do's. Amen. <laughs> you agree with me there? I mean, look, I, I haven't used a curse word in a long, long time. Probably I think the last time I used a curse word is 1979. And I shouldn't have used it then. And I still have a, I still, my heart still breaks when I think about that incident when I used that curse word. Because I, I didn't curse. I, I, and and, and I, I was a football coach, and I wouldn't let my coaches curse, and I wouldn't let my players curse. And one boy just lit my fire one day, and I let one go at him. And I still feel bad about it. 79, 1979. You know why? I don't, yeah, just, but I don't have that problem. But, man, I struggle with getting sometimes getting out and going soul winning. I struggle sometimes with wanting to pray. I struggle sometimes with wanting to love my neighbor. I struggle sometimes, struggle sometimes in wanting to be compassionate towards people that are less fortunate than me. I do. You know, I struggle with it. You know, I, I, got these, I, got these, I get these attitudes in my head and my mind, and, you know, and, and it's bad news, amen. It's really bad news, and, and, and it sometimes comes out. It shouldn't do that. So I can't do the things that I would. And so we're speaking about the battle with temptation and sin. And last week, very quickly, I made the statement, if the moment we got saved, we become perfect, that'd be wonderful. But that's not what happens. And then because we've recognized and realized we're not perfect, we become frustrated. In some cases, we become discouraged and depressed. And the truth of the matter is, a lot of people just give up on Christianity and quit. Because, well, it, it, you know, it, it's too hard. It is hard. And I say it again, if living Christian was easy, everybody would do it. It is hard, but it's not too hard. And the truth of the matter is, is that it may be hard, but there are wonderful rewards and blessings for fighting that battle and winning the victory. And there are some terrible consequences for not fighting the battle and not winning. And listen, I've never been inside, uh, inside of a jail. I thank God for that. But I could have been. 
I'm not criticizing anybody who has. And I have a lot of guys say, well, you know, uh, about people being in jail. I say, well, you just didn't get caught. Amen? Amen. But I'm glad that I worked and I fought these battles and these, at these temptations that were going on in my life. So that I, I, I've, I've never been with any woman uh, uh, in, in a relationship physically except with my wife. And I'm glad for that. But that didn't happen without a battle. Buddy, I'm telling you. You know, I don't care. You can tell me how great a Christian you are, but, I mean, that's, that's a battle for everybody. That's just a battle. And it's, it's just a battle, and you've got to fight the battle. And if you don't, you fail, you mess up. You Thank God there's a process to get forgiveness. Amen. I'm glad that every time I messed up, I confess my sin. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Amen. And I used to struggle because I was confessing the same thing over again. Can I tell you, I cannot count the number of times I did the same thing again, probably in the millions. And I finally got to the place where I thought, well, God can't keep forgiving me. And Curtis Hudson wrote a book and had a book on questions and answers. And one of them says, how many times do I commit a sin and the Lord forgive me? And Curtis Hudson said, it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And to cleanse us. All right, does it say if we confess five times, ten times, a hundred times, a thousand times? No, God is just faithful to forgive. That's not condoning sin. That's not an excuse for sin. That's a wonderful thing because if we didn't have that verse in there, I'd give up. Amen. If I thought I had to keep my salvation, I'd live in the church. I'd live in the church and I'd lose it in the church and I'd get baptized as soon as I got, I got saved again. And I'd be having to get baptized six or seven times a day, maybe more than that. Now, baptism doesn't save me, but as soon as you get saved, you don't get baptized, you disobey the Lord. If I believed I had to, had to keep myself saved, I'd never leave this church. And I'd do everything I could to keep everything from coming across my eyeballs. And I'd keep everything I could from coming across my ears. And, 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 and that still wouldn't do it because inside me there'd be all that stuff going on. Do you understand it? I mean, hey, we're in a battle. Amen. Amen. And so let's talk about this battle again. Truly born again Christians, we know that we are not supposed to sin. We said that last week. We'll not go into it again, but what, what should we say? Shall we t- continue in sin? God forbid. And then we said last week that temptation is a fact of life. It is not a sin to be tempted. That is a great truth because I, I, I felt like I had failed because I was being tempted. I felt real dirty because I was tempted. Well, I was dirty in a sense, but that was the flesh. But I was not dirty in God's mind because I had not given in to the temptation. See, Jesus was tempted in all points. Did that make him dirty? He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. The spot of sin, the dirt, the filth of sin does not come on you if you don't give in to the temptation. And so uh, temptation happens to all of us. It's not a sin to be tempted. It is a sin when you give in to temptation. James said every man is tempted. Amen? When he's drawn away his own lust and enticed, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. It's the conception. It is that moment in which I choose to do it. Suppose I'm walking down the street, and uh, all of a sudden somebody comes up, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, comes up to me and says, hey, let's go over here and rob a bank. Now, I'm not dirty because that temptation was given to me. I'm not sinned because that temptation came to me. But when I say, okay, and we go do the act of robbing the bank, now I have committed the sin. If I have the thought to lie, I'm going to lie about this, that temptation to lie is not a sin. But if I go ahead and I conceive or I say, okay, and I tell the lie, that's a sin. If I look in, in, a, in a magazine and I see some lady in there that's not appropriate and something inside me wants to continue to look in a way that should not be done, if I look in a way that should not be done, then I am guilty of a sin. If I close the magazine and say, no, I have not committed the sin. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Okay. And uh, so we have all these battles and struggles, you know. Uh, if I walk by and I see a $500 bill laying on a table somewhere, and the thought goes through my head, nobody here, you could pick it up, nobody would know. That's a temptation. That does not mean that I've sinned. When I pick up the $500 bill and put it in my pocket, I'm now guilty of stealing, amen, and that is the sin. That's the way it works, okay? The battle is unavoidable, we said last week. And and so go with me to James, Romans chapter 7, if you would, tonight. 
And I think this is one of the greatest passages in the Scripture. This passage of Scripture right here virtually, I mean literally, saved my life. It saved my life spiritually. In Romans 7, verses 14 through 25, that passage of Scripture saved my life spiritually. Kept me from ending up in prison. Kept me from ending up with some terrible sins in my life. It really did. I didn't keep all sin out of my life. Nobody here has, amen. But I, I, I like what David said. He said, keep back thy servant from secret faults, lest he be guilty of the great transgression. What is a great transgression? Well, I, I, I don't know. There's a lot of people say things about that. And some people believe it's the sin unto death. I don't know it's the sin unto death. I think it's this. I think he's saying, you know, God, these secret things are going to cause me to do something really big and bad someday. If I just keep having these little secret thoughts going on in my mind, eventually I'm going to end up doing this. Amen? I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer, I don't know if you remember who Jeffrey Dahmer was, but what a terrible person, killed a bunch of young boys and uh, um, molested them and killed them and even ate some flesh and buried them in the backyard. And uh, James Dobbs interviewed him when he was in prison on death row, and he said, started by watching things on television. And then he had to graduate to more hardcore stuff. You see, it, it happened because he allowed that little thing. The Bible talks about the little foxes that spoil the vine. How many of you, how many of you ever heard something you shouldn't have heard uh, 25 years ago and you can still remember it? But you can't remember what the preacher preached last week. Isn't that the flesh? I mean, I remember, I remember, you know, I wasn't living for the Lord. My wife and I went to a, a, a movie at the college when we were at Bethany. We know what kind of movie it was, Student Union. No, they had it open for everybody to come in. We went, and the thing turned into a real bad deal. And we walked out. But I can still remember what I saw. I can still remember it. I should have never gone there, but I did. I, you know, I'm naive and backslidden and thought it was, you know, something to do rather than sit around and twiddle your thumbs and get in trouble, Amen. And, uh, but it was a bad thing. You know, sad, I can remember, I can remember things that were said to me that are off color and wrong when I can't remember scriptures. Amen? It's the sin nature. It's the battle we're in. And so look at Romans chapter 7, verse 14, very quickly with me. Paul here writing, and this, this, let me impress this to you. I read, I, I researched it, and somebody said that they have figured that Paul had been saved for 35 years when he wrote this. We're not talking about some novice Christian. We're talking about a man who, who was probably the best Christian to ever live, who wrote more books of the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit than anybody else, a mature Christian. And, and he says in Romans chapter 7, verse, and this made me feel good. If Paul, that good of a Christian, that mature Christian, had this battle, I guess, I guess, I, I guess I, I'm not too bad off. I'm not saying my sin is good, but I, it, it helped me to understand that I was a normal Christian. You see, I thought all Christians were perfect. When I looked at everybody else, I thought they were perfect because I couldn't see inside their heart. And you know what? Nobody that's a good Christian is going to go out and flaunt their dirty laundry. So what we do as good Christians is if we got a problem, we hide it. Amen? So nobody knows it. And then we're shocked when it happens, when it comes out. Oh, did you hear? Uh, yeah, well, I'm saddened, but I, I, I'm not shocked anymore. I'm just saddened, heartbroken. And many times I'm crushed for the person because I love them. And many times I want to run to him, and I think we should run to him. Galatians chapter 6. If a man be overtaken, if a brother be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Don't crucify them. Amen. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And you do it with meekness, the Bible said, considering thine own self, lest thou also be tempted. Well, I never do that. Oh, really? Don't say never. By God's grace, I hope I never do that. You ought to make a determination by God's grace and help I'll never do that. But don't you get so cocky and proud that you say, I could never do that because you don't know what you can do. You can do anything anybody else can do. Amen. And that's pretty depraved. Humanity is depraved, folks. It's bad. This sin nature I have is bad. That's why I can't trust my flesh. 
That's why I can't walk in my own wisdom, my own understanding, my own knowledge, because I got a bunch of stuff in there that just ain't right. Amen. John Chan, so look at Romans 7, 14. For we know that the law, God's word, is spiritual. Paul said, but I am carnal. Now, he doesn't say he's natural. Natural means that you're not saved. But carnal means that you have a fleshly uh, nature. You're worldly. Paul said, my nature, my, my natural nature is carnal. Look what he says, sold under sin. You know that we are slaves to sin the moment we're born? And Christ really redeems us from the slave market of sin to set us free. But the truth of the matter is we were born sold to sin. We were already addicted. We were already in, in, under the power of sin when we were born. David said in sin did his mother conceive him. He wasn't saying that his mother and father were uh, sinning out of wedlock. He's saying that he was conceived with the sin nature. Adam sinned and sin passed upon all men. How? Because of the nature. My dad's a sinner. I, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. My kids are sinners. My kids are sinners. My grandchildren are sinners. And so and so and so and so and so it goes. The first man, Adam, gave us a sin nature. The second man, Adam, gives us a spirit nature. Amen. You understand that. Now, look what he says in verse 15. I read this passage of Scripture, and I said, This is me. It's like looking in a mirror. For that which I do, I allow not. He said, The things I'm doing, I allow not. He said, That's not what I want to do. But what I hate, that do I. Boy, I said, Lord, that's me. I know what I should be doing, and I'm not doing it. And, Lord, I hate what I'm doing. I know it's wrong. Can I tell you, if you're truly saved, you're going to be miserable when you're dealing with this flesh. And Christians that aren't miserable when they're dealing with their flesh, I don't believe, I'm not saying they're not saved, but I say this, they don't have a very good walk with the Spirit. Amen. The closer you get to God the more disturbed you will be about your sin. Further away you get from God, the less disturbed you are about your sin. By the way, if you get to church and stay in church, you'll be disturbed about your sin. If you get away from church and stay away from church, you'll quit being disturbed about your sin. See? I mean, it's just the way it is. You've got to stay close to God. Now look at verse number 16. I, if, if then I do that, I would not. I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it. He said, I want you to get this. Not I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin dwells in us. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, he qualifies now. It's the flesh nature. It's that sin nature. Dwelleth no good thing. You ought to circle that. Dwelleth no good thing. You know, some of us, we try to think that our flesh is good. We try to act like, well, you know what, I mean, I'm not all bad. No, you're not all bad, but you understand something? The truth of the matter is, is that we can never th say that anything that's fleshly is good. And no such thing as a good lie. There's no such thing as a good anger thought, you know. I mean, there's no such thing as these things. There's no such thing. Now, when I say a good anger thought, I mean, there, there's the wrath of God. I understand there's righteous judgment, righteous holiness. I understand that. You know, I think you understand what I'm talking about. When you get an attitude and you, you're, wanting to, you're wanting to have an attitude, you know, you're walking around with a toad. There's no such thing as a good toad. I got an attitude, you know, I don't care. You know, no, 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 no. Don't, don't, be, don't, be, don't be justifying and defending flesh. For in the flesh is no good thing. So he says in, in verse 18, For to will is present with me. I will, I want to do what God wants me to. I want to do the will of God. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Whew. Man, it just sounds like me. And I want to do the good. Sometimes you just don't get it done. Look at verse 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law. And you ought to circle those words in verse 21. I find then a law. Those words jumped out at me, and the Holy Ghost said to me, this is an immutable truth. That's what a law is. 
A law is an immutable truth. This is the immutable truth. I, I find then a law. What is the law? When I would do good, evil is present with me. Now Paul says, here's the law. Here's how it is. This is the way it is. It is not going to change. Whenever I do, would do good, evil is present with me. You're going to always have that. There's always good and evil. It's always there. And it's always giving you the option. You can do good or you can do evil, but you can't do both. And that's where we live. That's where we're at. And so I get up in the morning and I can pray or I can not pray. One is good and one is evil. I get up in the morning, I can read my Bible, and I can not read my Bible. One is good, and one is evil. I get up in the morning, I can kiss my wife and tell her I love her, or I can get up and I can, and I can have a bad attitude and say nasty things to her. And that, that's good, or that's evil. I can't do both. i got to choose one of them. Amen. And it's always there. I always have the option to tell the truth or lie. Are you ever tempted to lie? There are many times I'm tempted to lie when people ask me things I don't want them to ask me. I mean, sometimes I want to know why people have to be such busybodies. Because when they start asking me questions, I don't want to answer, you know, uh, because I don't want people to really see what's going on. Amen. If I tell the truth, I'm not, you're not, you're not going to like it. I'm not going to like it. So when I, evil is present with me. Do you see that? Amen. For I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now look at verse number 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Here's what makes you a Christian. When the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. If you're not careful with that verse, you're going to say that if anybody sins, if everything didn't change in your life to become perfect, you're not saved. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that when the Holy Spirit came in, Everything did become new because you have a totally, now you have a totally perfect person living in you you never had before. That's totally new. Before the Holy Spirit came in, I was nothing but a sinner. When the Holy Spirit came in, everything became new because now there's a new person in me. There's a new nature. And it's a delight or a desire. Look what he says there in verse 8. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So what happens, God put, comes in and now you have a delight for the right things. You didn't have it before. You didn't want to do right before. You might have wanted to do right because of a, of a conscience, or you might have wanted to do right because you didn't want to have the consequences. But the truth of the matter is you didn't have a real desire in your heart to know God, to please God, and to walk according to His Word. In fact, the Bible says that that's foolishness to a lost man. And many of us, before we were saved, we thought Christians were foolish because they went to church three times a week. We thought Christians were foolish because they didn't drink, smoke, cuss, and, get, and carouse around. We thought they were foolish because they didn't go to all the dances and the movies and all that kind of We thought they were foolish, but they're crazy. What is wrong with these people? What's wrong with them is the Holy Ghost came in, and now they have new delights and new desires. Amen. Amen. Look at verse number 23. But I see another law. Here's another immutable truth. It can't be changed. This is the truth. This is the way it is. Another law in my members, what does, this person, what does this do? It wars against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is on my members. That's that flesh nature. That's that lust that we talk about in Galatians where the spirit is lusting or is warring to get us to do right. And the flesh is warring to get us to do wrong. And that's just the law, folks. Now watch it in verse number 24. Look what he says in verse 24 with an exclamation mark, Oh, wretched man that I am. Now, to, to, to me, there's something wrong in your Christian life if you've never had that feeling. You claim to be saved and, and claim, and, and, and I'm not, you're saved, and, 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 but there's no ever time in your life you feel, Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, what a wretched person. What a wicked person I am. That should be a feeling. If you're really trying to live for God, you should have those feelings. Well, I thought Christianity was supposed to be all pie in the sky by and by. I don't know who sold you that wooden nickel, but it's not true. It would be all pie in the sky by and by if you and I never did wrong. But when you and I do wrong, there ought to be something inside us that says, I'm wretched. I hate. I hate this. I hate. I've actually, I hate myself. 
I don't mean it in a bad way, but I hate myself. I should hate sin. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. If it's in me, why shouldn't I hate that too? We want to hate everybody else's evil. How about my own evil? I hate my evil. I hate it when I disobey my Heavenly Father. I hate it when I have thoughts I shouldn't have. I hate it. And my heart is crying, oh, wretched man that I am. That's, that proves you're saved. If it don't bother you, there's something wrong with your Christianity. Something wrong with a Christian who's sinning and it, it doesn't bother them. Now, I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm saying that they're not spiritual. They're carnal. See, there's two types of people in the world, natural and spiritual. That's, that's, that's lost and saved. But in the saved category, there's spiritual and carnal. Spiritual means somebody that's walking in the spirit and therefore has a close relationship with God. Carnal means somebody who's walking in the flesh or the world and therefore does not have a close relationship with God. You may be here tonight saved. It might not be spiritual. It might be carnal. Which means you're more worldly and worldly influence and worldly acting and worldly behaving than you are Christian acting and Christian influence. Which means you need to quit being carnal, walking in the flesh. And you need to start learning how to be spiritual and walk in the spirit. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. And the wretched man that I am. And he asked the question in verse 24, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Have you ever just gotten so burdened you said, God, how? Lord, please help me. Show me how. I'm going to get victory. And he uses the word who, which is what God wanted him to, because God's going to point us to the who. Look at verse number, number 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who is the who that's going to help us with this? It's Jesus. And unless you have Jesus, you can't get helped with it. Amen. But once you have Jesus, I promise you that Jesus comes into your heart in the person of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you, and he lives there for the purpose of helping you and delivering you out of this battle and delivering you into the victorious life. Amen. And that's what he wants to do. He wants us to become victorious in our spiritual life. We are defeated and discouraged. We're beat down and controlled by these sins and these attitudes. And God's purpose in our life is to get us to the place where we are victorious over those sins. Amen and amen. Now watch the next statement and don't miss this. And we'll get to this in just a moment. Look at the end in verse number 25. So then, Paul understood something. God showed him. So then, with the what? Mind. You ought to circle that word. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of what? God. So how do I serve the law of God? What do I serve it with? The mind. Don't miss this. Right here. Right here. You want to know where all of this can transpires and where all this takes place and how you get to victory? It's all right here. The whole spiritual warfare is wrapped up right here. With the mind, he says, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And here's what he's saying. He's saying that if you and I are going to win the victory, we're going to have to learn to fight the battle by thinking. Thinking. The mind is where we reason things out, where we think, where we understand, where we grasp, where we make decisions. You see that $500 bill laying there I talked about earlier? And the devil puts a, a lust to go through my and take it. And my mind has to kick in and say, hey, that ain't right. And my mind has to get control of my body and make the right decision. If my mind makes the right decision, I will not pick up that $500 bill. But if my mind lets the lust control it, the desire, to, uh, the wicked desire to control it, then I will pick up that $500 bill. And so, but I have to learn that the spiritual warfare is taking place right here with my mind. But, but brother, brother Wass, and you've probably heard this, Brother Wass used to, uh, the Christian school I taught in, almost every chapel service would say to the young people, young people, life is based on your choices. Life is based on your choices. 
And not a one of us in here tonight can say about probably 99.99% of the things that we've, we've gotten involved in that somebody else made us do it. We made the choice. Flip Wilson, the comedian, used to dress up as Geraldine. I'm going back. You young people don't even know what I'm talking about. He was an African-American uh, 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 comedian. He was a funny guy. He'd get on this dress, and, which is abomination to God. Amen. And he dressed up like this. He killed him. He said, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. The devil didn't make you do it. The devil tempted you to do it. But I chose he placed it out there and waved it before me, and I had a choice to make. Am I going to do it or am I not? And can I tell you, I've made a lot of bad choices in my life. Can I tell you, I've made more bad choices than I want to count. I can't even count them. Amen? I want to tell you tonight that, uh, that, uh, that no preacher, I don't care who he is, is any better than anybody sitting in the pew. He has no better flesh. He may, have, he may have learned how to live the spiritual life stronger, but listen to me, so can you. So can you. And we need to understand it. So now, the failure. The failure to win this battle has serious consequences. Go to Galatians chapter 6 with me very quickly. Galatians chapter 6. We need to win this battle. I want you to understand the consequences if we don't. Genesis, Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now you listen to me, folks. Listen to me. I don't care what the devil tells you. I don't care what your friends tell you. I don't care what the world tells you. I do not care if you make a decision. There is always a result from that decision. Always. Always. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now God gives us the two sides of the coin. Verse 8, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. You and I do wrong, I promise you it's going to bring some, and that little word there means rottenness or spoiling to your life. It's going to bring something in your life that stinks. You're going to say, this stinks. You know, I hate this. I wish I hadn't. You're going to say those words. Here's the point, though. You can never take back a decision. A decision laid is a decision made. Amen? Once you make it, it it's played. It's done. Now, I think you can nip some of those decisions in the bud real quick. In other words, I can make the decision right now. And five seconds later, say, no, I'm not doing that. And I can have a change of heart. But once I make the decision and then commit the choice, it's too late. So there's always a reaping what you sow. For you sow to the flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of Spirit reap life everlasting. He's not talking about being saved there. He's talking about this joy, this everlasting joy that we have as a Christian. You know, I'm not saved by my works. Amen? So that's not what it's talking about there. It's talking about a life that is, is, a, is, the, is the everlasting life, the life that God wants to have, because we got everlasting life right now. I'm not going to get everlasting life and get to heaven. I have eternal life and everlasting life. And I, that means I have a, some blessings that God wants me to have. It's like the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, that represented salvation. When they went into the promised land, that didn't represent heaven. That represented being in the center of God's will. And God wanted them to be blessed, so he gave them a bunch of laws and rules and said, if you keep these, I'll bless you. If you don't keep them, I'll curse you. Old Testament principle is still a New Testament principle. Amen? And those Jews could have lived in all that wonderful blessing and all that, but they chose to do wrong, and so they lived under the consequences. They ended up losing their land. They ended up uh, millions of them being butchered and killed and destroyed. Why? Because they sowed to the flesh. Let me tell you about sowing to the flesh. When you sow the flesh, you will reap. But usually here's what happens. You usually reap more than you sow. My, grandmother put, my grandfather put one wheat in the ground, one piece of wheat in the ground, and it grew up and it had a whole head of 12 or 13 kernels. 
See, David committed that sin with Bathsheba, but he paid fourfold. You reap in kind like you, like you sow. My grandpa put wheat in the ground, wheat came back. You know, uh, those brothers, of, those brothers of, 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 of Jacob, he deceived his father with some wool and stole the birthright. And later his sons took a lamb and used the blood to deceive him about Joseph. And I want you to say something. I want you to say something. You reap later than what you sow. Here's what happens. Because I happened, I did it and nothing happened to me that night I did it or that day I did it and nothing happened to me the next day or a week down the road or a month down the road. I just think, well, nothing's going to happen. God forgot. No, God didn't forget. There's payday someday. Amen. Amen. There are consequences. If we don't win this battle, there's going to be consequences. Listen, I, I am, I am brokenhearted about the number of children that have to live with dad on this weekend and mom on that weekend in Christian homes because they made a decision to violate God's Word. And maybe those parents don't think they're reaping anything, but their children are reaping. Can I tell you that God says that the children will reap what the fathers have sown? Unto the third and fourth generation... Can I tell you that we have family curses that we need to break? And if we don't do something about it, it's just going to keep passing from one generation to the next generation. And some Christian in the generation has got to say, wait, time out. As for me, I'm not running down that path. I've always been amazed how a, a drunkard who beats his wife can raise a drunkard who beats his wife. Because I can't imagine any kid watching his mother be beaten and listen to that cursing, drunken dad who would want to be a cursed, drunken dad beating his wife. But it happens. Why? Because they didn't think there's any consequence to their action, but there are consequences to their actions. Amen? And also the consequences of alcohol consumption. You know, when Brother Jesse's brother Jason did get out of the hospital and his kidney started going, praise the Lord. But you know why he was in there? He's in there because he drinks all the time. He about died. He about paid the price. His kidneys shut down. Everything shut down. And, and you know, that happens. The enlarged livers and all that, you know, all that stuff that happens because you drink that stuff. Look, I'm glad I, I didn't drink in my life. I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't start smoking. I'm not going to say anybody it has. I'm just glad I didn't because there's consequences. There's always consequences. Amen. And, that, and God's not mad at me. He wants us to see that. Then go to Proverbs chapter, or go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, there's the first consequence of reaping, reaping what you sow. There's a second consequence in Hebrews chapter 12, and look at verse number 6. The second cha- a consequence, Hebrews 12, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So the second consequence of not winning this battle is you get chastened, you get whipped. The Bible says very clearly, if you're a Christian and you're not being whipped, you're not God's child. Amen. How does God whip us? Let me tell you what I believe. God whips us mostly with a thing called guilt. Guilt. If you sin and you don't have any guilt, there's something wrong with that. Now, there is the possibility of being a Christian and not knowing something is sin. And so you don't feel guilty about something you don't know is wrong. But you all had this experience. Uh, before you got saved, you did a lot of things were wrong. You didn't know they were wrong. You got saved, you started hearing preaching. Started reading your Bible. If you're like me, you came under conviction. You looked up to God and said, oh, God, I didn't even know that's a sin. I'm so sorry. It forced me to have because of guilt. Chastening. Chastening. I used to go out on Friday nights. The Holy Spirit tell me not to go. I'd go anyway. I'd do what I was going to do. And it was all fun while I was doing it because there's pleasure in sin. When you're sinning, you aren't listening to the Holy Ghost. But as soon as I drop those friends off and just me in that car with the Holy Spirit, man, he start whooping on me. What in the world were you doing? Why in the world do you do that? I mean, man, and I, by the time I got home, I was a basket case laying out in the middle of the floor of my parents' bathroom saying, God, I don't know why I do this. I don't want to do this. God, please. You know, that was Paul. But I got whooped. 
God can take the whooping above guilt now. God can take, can take the, the whooping to problems, sickness, and death. Many times the problems we're having are a result of God saying, I no longer can let you do this. I'm going to have to whoop you. Many sicknesses, not all sicknesses, but many times sickness, Paul said to the church of Corinth, some of you are sick because of your mis 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 uh, misappropriating the Lord's Supper. And then he said, some of you even sleep. You're dead. The Bible says, if you see your brother sin a sin which is not unto death, pray for him. But if you see your brother sin a sin which is not unto death, don't pray for him. It's too late. I had two of my teenage boys that went to my Christian school that I buried before they were 30 years of age. You understand me? And one of them came to church two weeks before he died, sat on the front row, and I went over and said, it's so good to see you. I've been praying for you. I love you. He said, preacher, I need to get back in church. I said, okay, buddy, you sure do. I love you. He said, I'll be here next week. He went home that afternoon, ate with his family. He said to his mama, mama, if I don't get right, something's going to happen to me. He didn't come to church the next week, and that week he, he was with his girlfriend that he was living with. She passed a semi on a hill, and they got hit head on. He went out into eternity just like that. He knew God was dealing with him. He knew God was chasing him. And he said, I don't really care. He did care, but he, wasn't, he didn't make the right decision. Amen? So be careful, friend. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to tell you what God says. Amen? And then there's this matter of the ruined testimony. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11 says, Even a child is known by his doings. Hey, look. What's the first thing you remember, you, you, you remember when we say the name David? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Bathsheba. Well, David did all these other things. What's the first thing that came to your mind? Bathsheba ruined his testimony. What's the first thing you think about? Samson, Delilah. But what about all the Philistines and all that power set? Yeah, but it ruined it. What is it you think about Lot? Righteous man. But he vexed his righteous soul daily. And the Bible, now Lot, he was a just man. But what do we remember? His testimony is ruined. And I know many of a wonderful preacher who will never stand in a pulpit again. They will never preach another sermon. They will never have the respect of God's people because they did not keep their life under control. Sad. But that's why we have to fight this battle because I don't want my name trash. You know what my daddy, my daddy said to me, son? He said, the most valuable thing I gave you was your last name. He said, don't you dare trash it. The name. The Bible tells us how valuable the name is. They'll ruin your testimony. Then go to 1 John chapter 2 with me. I'm not going to get into I'm not going to finish this tonight. So you're going to have to come back next week if you want to find the, the last part. And if I keep preaching long enough, you'll keep coming back. Amen. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And look what it says in verse number 3. And hereby... We do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. The third thing that's a consequence of not winning this battle, of, 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 of not winning this battle, is a thing called doubt. Doubt. You know, when I deal with people about doubting their salvation, I deal with them about doubting their salvation. There's, there's two reasons why a person doubts their salvation, basically. Number one, they're not saved. Number two, they're not living right. You know, somebody who's habitually sinning has a hard time having assurance of their salvation. How do you know, Brother Houston? I know. I went through 16, 17 years of it. You're not saved by works, but we know we're saved on two good works. And we know as Christians we shouldn't do it. we got this battle going on. And so when we don't live right, it's just a natural doubt that takes place in our life. Well, if I'm a Christian, why do I do this? If I'm a Christian, why do I think this? If I, and that's what I had to get delivered from by studying this. I went to preacher after preacher to try to get assurances of my salvation. All they did was go through the plan of salvation. And I said I'd done that. Or I prayed several times to get saved again. I didn't need to get saved. What I needed to do was get right. And when I got right, then I no longer had those doubts. Now, I'm not saved by my righteousness, but I'm saved unto righteousness. And, if, and it says that we know 
Not, we know, not that we know him, but we know that we know him if, if, there's a condition, if we keep his commandments. Many children that get saved at a young age go through a period of doubting their salvation. Did you know that? I'm for children getting saved early. I'd rather them get saved early than later. But they go through a doubting of their salvation because when you're five years of age, you have not yet really experienced life. You've never come face to face with real temptation, and you've never really done anything bad wrong. But all of a sudden, as a teenage Christian, all of a sudden, everything that all other teenagers is going through and all that stuff that is going on, it starts attacking you with viciously, I mean with ferocity. And you know you shouldn't do it. The Bible says, He that sinneth willfully after, after the knowledge of the truth remain on sacrifice for sin. It's hard for you to forgive yourself and act like it didn't happen when you did it willfully. Let me explain that to you. You've got somebody who comes into church and he's, he's done everything in the world. He gets saved and immediately it's all washed away and rolled off his shoulders. And I'm forgiven. But you take a kid that got saved in his five, and then he got into trouble and into sin. He struggles and struggles and struggles. Why did I do that? Well, maybe I wasn't saved. And goes through this pit, this, this pit of depression and discouragement because there's a real devil using that against him. One of the consequences of sinning is, is it causes you to doubt. If I'm a Christian, why do I think this? If I'm a Christian, why do I say that? If I'm a Christian, why do I do that? Well, I'm not condoning any of those things tonight, but I want you to know something. If you're saved, you're a Christian, amen, and you do those things because you have a sin nature, and you need to learn that truth so that you can get victory over the doubt and the devil when he attacks you, amen. I am saved. I had to look the old devil in the face and say, Devil, I don't care what you say. I got saved at the five years of age at the Haven Baptist Church in Haven, Kansas. I'm on my way to heaven. I belong to Jesus, and you are an absolute liar. That's why the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. You just tell the rascal your testimony. And that you're believing in Jesus and that you're saved and you know it and he can just go. Amen. And if you have to do it 5,000 times in an hour, just keep doing it. Until the dirty rascal decides to leave you alone. And sometimes he does quicker and sometimes he doesn't. And lastly, go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 16. Even the loss of your life. And I already talked about this, but let's look at it. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 16. If any man see his brother, who's my brother? Written to the believers. So, you're my brother. You're my sister. I'm your brother. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death. I mean, that means he sinned and he, he lived through it. And we all have done that. And here's what's talking about us being concerned about your brothers. What is loving your brother? It means to be concerned about them. What is love? Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. If a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. It doesn't say rip them. And a lot of damage done by people who are very unkind to other Christians. They're going to the Christian and say, oh, look, you know. Well, I had a guy, a guy that came to my church that he messed up as a preacher. As soon as I heard it, immediately my heart broke. I called him up. The first thing that went through my mind was not you dirty rascal, you, 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 you pervert, you, you know, that's what people do. First thing that went through my mind is wonder what I could have done, what I didn't do. Maybe if I'd been a better friend. I'm up and said, brother, I heard somebody said, it's true. That I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to hide by it. I'm going to pay my price. I said, brother, I just want you to know, first thing that went through my heart was, I wonder if I'd have been a better friend if this might not have happened. I said, man, I love you. I want you to know I love you. Is there anything I can do for you? He said, preacher, I appreciate you're the only person who's called me with that attitude. 
Isn't that sad? Pretty sad. I went and visited him while he was paying his time. I welcomed his family into our church so that I could minister to them and love them. The Christian army is the only one that kills their wounded. Amen. That's not biblical. You restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Now, you can't do it meekly. Don't go do it. Well, I'm coming over here to get you straightened out. No, you aren't. You come over here to be arrogant and proud. Humble yourself. If a man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them sin on death. You see, we have the power of intercessory prayer. Here's what I'm talking about. I, I, I see some brother, and I see things going in his life, and I know that this brother's headed for destruction. You know what God's given me the power to do? Get on my knees and pray for him. Oh, dear God, please help brother so-and-so to see what he's going, what's going on and what's going to head him. Oh, God, please be merciful. That's what Moses did. God was going to destroy all the Jews. Moses said, wait a minute. God, please don't do that. Intercessory prayer. He sinned to sin, and God hasn't taken his life. So you and I have the opportunity to pray for that brother. And that's not really the point of the, the verse, but I wanted you to see that. Then it goes on to say, there, uh, 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 and he shall give him life for them that sin unto death. And then the next statement, there is a sin unto death. There is. There is. You ought to circle that. Not might be. There is. You know, God has got a line. If you step over, you're done. Now, I've seen parents with a line like that, and I don't think they were wrong. Yeah, I mean, you put up with so much, but there comes a line where your kids say, okay, you know, that's it. Pack your bags. Well, you don't love me. Yeah, I love you. But you can't just keep, 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 keep. I can't tell you where God's line is. I can tell you this. The fear of God is a good thing to have. So you don't think you can continue and continue and continue and nothing's going to happen. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that you shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm just telling you why it's serious that you and I start working and getting victory. I really believe this. If I had not started getting victory in my life, I don't know where I'd be today. At the very best, I would probably be maybe have avoided prison and probably had quite a mess with my family, if I even had a family. Thank God that he began to work in my heart. At the worst, I'd probably be executed in prison. And some people, some people say, that's hard for me to believe, Brother Houston. Well, maybe. But it wasn't out here. You couldn't see it. It was in here. You know what? Listen to me. I'm not trying to be mean, but I don't think it, most Christians in this world are so spiritual that they don't have some things they're hiding. We don't want anybody to know it, but they're there. And God knows they're there because God sees the heart. We're naked and open before him. <laughs> so he said, Brother Houston, you're just so plain and blunt about yourself. Well, God knows. I don't think we ought to be so holier than thou and proud that we walk around acting like we're something we're not. I'm a sinner. Praise God, saved by grace. And I'm not what I used to be, thank God, but I'm not what I ought to be either. Amen. And I want to get better. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm, not, I'm about done here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and look at verse number 16, if you would, with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Look at verse 17. If any man, if any man defile the temple of God, 
Him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. You see, pride comes before the fall. You know where it starts happening? When we start thinking we're real smart. Look at me, you know. I would never do anything like that. Really? Pride comes before the fall. I got it all together. Really? You're the smart one, right? When you die, all wisdom's going to die. You and I started, when I was young, started pastoring. You know, I thought I had all the answers. Now I'm 60 years old, and I've pastored for 26 years, been in the ministry for 30 years. Been preaching off and on. Well, I'm born of that now. I've been in ministry 32 years. You know what I know now? I don't even have half the questions. You folks come to me with questions all the time, and I pastor came with questions to me all the time and said, folks, I don't have the answer. I'll do my best to see if God will give me one. But I don't have the answer. I don't want to deceive myself into believing. Hey, I got it made. I've licked it all. <laughs> Look here. Do like me. No. Uh -uh. Do like Jesus. <laughs> Watch yourself. Be aware of what's going on. You know what? Think about what you think. You know what I've learned to do? I've learned to be very, very aware of what's going on in Ted Houston. I don't know what's going on in your life. I might see a few things, but you know what I do? I don't, I don't worry too much about them. I don't spend my time on them. Because i got a full-time job taking care of this guy right here. And this is the guy I'm going to account for. So I'm walking around with a magnifying glass. I'm walking around with a mirror. That was wrong, Ted. God, I'm sorry. Oh, God, help me. God, please, I don't want to do this. Oh, God, I'm in a battle. I'll close with this. I think I said it the other day, but I want to say it again. Sin, temptation, the devil's attack is like a Chinese water torture. Sometimes a thought will just come, but if the devil's really after you, you know what he's going to do? He's going to keep that thought rolling through your mind for hours if he can. Literally, I've fought the devil for hours. I've fought thoughts in my head for hours. Hours. Trying to focus on things that are right, do right, and they just won't go away. <sighs> well, you say, I, I don't know if I like you much. Well, I don't care. I love you. If you don't have those problems, hallelujah, you're a much better Christian than I am. But I don't think I'm talking to people that are unaware of what I'm talking about. Because it is a spiritual warfare, and we're all in it. And thank God, and no matter what I do, I'm saved. And thank God that no matter where I'm at, what I'm going through, God is always right there if I need His help. And He'll never leave me nor forsake me. Our Father in heaven, I hope somehow I've been...